trying. Engineers will do to the society. 
to be granted the professional status. 1771, after the Society of Civil Engineers was established, I will fast forward to 1818. In the year 1818, the Society of Civil Engineers renamed themselves as Institute of Civil Engineers. Now, what happened in between? Why should the Society of Civil Engineers become the Institute of Civil Engineers? Well, I guess they wanted to stress this point again that they have come to this stage where they should be now considered very seriously. The word society somewhat denotes a kind of uh, tribalistic mindset, you know, some kind of gang or something. You want to say we are not that, we are actually some kind of distinguished gentleman here. So they renamed themselves as the Institute of Civil Engineers in 1818. And then they applied for the Royal Charter. Royal Charter getting the permission of the Crown, English Crown, to practice the profession. They applied for it. Every profession had to get the Royal Charter to practice the profession. Then when they applied for the Royal Charter, the first question had to be answered. Engineering had to be defined. Though in 1771 they established Society of Civil Engineers, there was no definition for engineering. Now that they had to apply for Royal Charter, they had to define engineering. And one person took upon himself to define what is engineering. Does anyone know who defined engineering? What was the definition? Unfortunately, if you search in Google about this person, you will not get anything. It's quite surprising. And because there is nothing on the internet, not many people of this generation know about it. Because we limit our knowledge to whatever is available on the internet. If it is not there on the internet, it simply does not exist for us. But this gem of a guy and his work is today not available. His name was Thomas Redgold. Thomas Redgold was a self-taught, you can say, engineer. He wrote one of the first popular textbooks of engineering on carpentry. The book he wrote on carpentry was a standard reference book on the subject for many years itself. He defined engineering for the first time. Upon the request of the Institute of Civil Engineers, he defined engineering. Thomas Treadwell. How did he define engineering as? See, remember, when he had to define engineering, he had to put on a social purpose. There, there should have been some social purpose. Why we are existing as engineers? So he defined engineering like this. He said engineering is the art of converting the forces in the nature to something beneficial for the mankind. So what will engineers do is transform the forces in the nature into something which is useful to man. The assumption here is that there is so much forces in the nature which are not tamed and untamed natural forces cause harm to men. So therefore they have to be tamed and then something beneficial out of it should be derived. Who does that? Engineers. So in turn he established a social purpose. If you see the history of engineering from then onwards, you will see that all major engineering branches, divisions, define themselves in line with this definition. So what is the force of the nature that they are interested in? They name themselves after that. That is why there was mechanical engineering, which was transforming mechanical energy into something. Then there was electrical engineering, which was transforming electrical energy into something. 
So the underlying point which I am making is that definition for a long time served the served as the guiding principle for engineers. Now let us come to the point. If this should be the guiding principle for engineers, then does computer engineering in general? And we let us let us call ourselves as information science engineers or if you want software engineers. What is that force in the nature that we are transforming for the betterment of mankind? Or are we in the wrong place? I mean, if, if, we, if we are indeed engineers and if indeed what we are doing is engineering, then we should transform some force in nature into something useful to humans. actually the point. Many of them don't recognize this very clearly. But if there should be a social function for engineers, we engineers, software engineers or what we call ourselves as, that is like health is for medicine, like justice is for lawyers, it is information for us. That's what I mean. So our main job is to take this information in some way and to present it to the people so that they get benefit. So the social purpose of us should be information. And how to give right kind of information at right time to right people. <coughs> that should be the foundation of our Now, let me come to the point. If this is the guiding principle of our profession, then can I argue that it is free software and not anything else which is implementing this in spirit and in practice? Proprietary software does not allow free flow of information. So can we argue for free software that in fact it is free software which has finally given the software engineers the powerful tool of staying loyal to the founding principles of engineering. That is my first argument. I leave the elaboration to you because you can actually do that. I am just making my statement. So my first argument for free software, unlike what people have been speaking till now, is that free software in fact establishes this fact very clearly through whatever principles we have in free software. Well now let me come to the second point which I want to See, it is not that software engineers did not think about this question before as a whole. We did think. The result of which was the ACM Code of Ethics for Computing Professionals and IEEE Code of Ethics. What is code of ethics? What is code of ethics? It's a formal statement from the professional community on this very precise question on where the loyalty of the professional should lie. Let us understand it like this. A doctor and a patient understand the relationship between them. What to whom should the loyalty of the doctors should lie? To whom should lawyer be loyal? Uh, the doctor should be loyal to? No 
questions are suggested to the patient. The doctor should do anything and everything possible to see that the patient gets the best care. The lawyer's loyalty lies firmly with his client. That is why even a person like Kasab deserves a lawyer who will defend him. So Kasab's lawyer's loyalty lies with Kasab. It is his professional duty to defend Kasab. However serious the crime of his client has made, it is the, it is the professional duty of the lawyer to defend his client. That is very clearly understood. No questions about this. But with engineering there is a problem. If you have to analyze this relationship. Mainly because engineers for a long time have not practiced their profession independently like lawyers or doctors. They have always been employees in some organization. You will rarely see engineers working independently. Once you are working within an organization, your interaction with client is indirect. You interact with your client indirectly through your organization. In such a situation, the engineer's loyalty is put to test. To whom should an engineer be loyal to? Should engineers be loyal to the organization to which he serves, his employer, or to his client? Most, in most of the cases, this will be this or that kind of a question. If you are loyal to your organization, you have to do some cheating with your client. Or if you want to serve your client better, then you have to compromise on your loyalty to the organization. This is going to happen. This is the tragedy of engineering profession mainly because the way we have developed our profession. Now software engineering community tried to answer this question by formulating code of ethics. Earlier there was ACM code of ethics, then there was family IEEE code of ethics. Finally these two bodies came together and finally gave us one code of ethics which is applicable to all professionals who are working in this area under different nomenclatures. The so code, the IEEE ACM joint code of ethics answers the question of loyalty of a software engineer. Does anyone know the code of ethics?
the clients and the employees in that order. Both come in second point. So first is for public. So software engineer should do, whenever he does something, should always have this uh, idea that he should not harm the general public. That is the first thing that we should remember. Second is our loyalty lies with clients and employees, that is point number two. Point number three is our loyalty should be firmly on the product that we are designing. The product. See, that is because in the early part of last century, when people were discussing on what is that highest ideal of engineering, some people suggested that it should be efficiency. Efficiency. What engineers should strive for, they should strive for efficiency. Efficiency before anything was a slogan of engineering for a long time. But then there is a problem. Will you go to an extent of harming the public because you want efficiency? There may be something, for example, a very, very pure kind of uh, uh, treating the uh, water in a chemical plant. If you want highly efficient process for that, you would add so much toxins into air and the, uh, the chemicals into the whole production that the outcome of the clean water that you receive ultimately may harm public because the effluents may reach lakes and pollute the lakes. But that kind of dilemma is always there. So whether you want efficiency or whether you will put public first. So that is why in our code of ethics we have put public first and then efficiency later. Okay? So first with public, then with clients and employees, then with the product itself. These are the three things. Then there are two things which are very interesting. One is professional judgment, next is management. These are the, I am speaking about the key operative words in the code of ethics. There is a great amount of explanation. Judgment and management is the next two items in code of ethics. What do they mean? See, let us imagine the situation. You go to a doctor. Now, doctor diagnoses you and says that there is some complicated uh, situation with regards to your health and uh, it would be better if you operate. If the doctor operates on you, you have to undergo a surgery, a complicated surgery. Now, should you go by the doctor's judgment? Or do you have the freedom to say, no, I am okay. I will not go through operation. I will stay as I am. Okay, what, what's the big deal? I will die after six months, okay. But I will not go through operation. Do you have that freedom? Or should the doctor insist that no, tomorrow I will operate for you? Lie down, I will operate. Well, what should be the relation there? Who should make the judgment? <laughs> Patient should have the freedom. The doctor should not overemphasize. I mean, there is this very interesting uh, story which strikes to me. That of Gandhiji. Once that he had to drink something and he didn't drink, and doctor insisted. You know that story. And it's a professional dilemma story. For a long time, professionals, especially doctors, believe that they have the right to insist upon the kind of treatment upon patients. Probably many of you may have this syndrome, but I think your parents will definitely have this syndrome. When they go to the doctor, they will be so scary. They will be so scared to go to doctors. In a sense, whatever a doctor says is yes. That kind of mentality people do have. Many doctors also have this mentality. See some old doctors. They have this paternalistic mindset. They will insist, they will say, this is what I do, please do it. Do it only, do it only. And they will shout also in small towns, when there is one doctor per town, he will dominate. If he says you should do this, you should do this, that's all. So by the virtue of his profession, he will have that command. Now the question is, how should this relation should be defined in engineering? The same question. We have defined client professional relationships in many ways. I will come to it a bit later. That is why this point has been added here of judgment. Professionals should have the idea of coming at right judgment, professional judgment. That is there in our code of ethics. Next is management. 
when we are managing a team because software is generally produced in a team, you should behave in an ethical manner, responsibility and all that you also told. Next things define how we should relate with others. How should we give priorities? So they say the first priority we should be giving to our, we should be giving first priority to our co-workers, co-developers. Then we should do something to enhance the reputation of our profession. Then finally, point number eight says you should focus now on self. So where should our loyalty lies? Starting from public. The last priority should be given to you. So when there are situations that you will not benefit and society will benefit, definitely you should go for that, not for the final thing. Self is the last priority in the whole of things. This we should understand very clearly. This is what we as a professional group have committed ourselves to. Now, let me again go to my argument. Who has implemented this code of ethics in spirit? I claim and argue that it is free software who has actually implemented this code of ethics without saying anything about that in the true spirit. So my argument number two for free software is it is free software which has implemented the code of ethics in right spirit and in practice. My argument number one was, it is free software which has stayed loyal to the founding principles of engineering profession. So we stay loyal to the engineering profession. Second is we in fact implemented, we have implemented the code of ethics in right spirit. That is my second argument. I will come to my third argument. I mean, these are the arguments which you can't find anywhere. As a whole, if you look at the world as a slave, there are few countries which are overdeveloped, some countries which are developed, and some countries which are not developed. As a principle, Countries who claim themselves to be developed countries have tried to share their expertise with other lesser developed countries. This practice is going on for a long time. This applies for technology also. There is no obligation on the part of powerful countries to share something with others. But we think there is some moral responsibility of powerful countries to share their knowledge with others. The question of technology transfer from a powerful country to a less powerful country has been questioned for a long time. Let us take India and USA as a case study. Apart, I am not talking about politics, I am speaking strictly with respect to technology transfer. The technology transfer from a powerful country like USA to a country like India has taken two or three different ways. One way is direct technology transfer. I am not speaking of selling products like high, like uh, the, uh, the high-end planes and all that. I am not talking about selling products which people are today interested in. I am not talking about that. I am talking about technology transfer, the know-how of technology. Instead of selling planes to us, can you tell us how to make planes? That technology transfer, at some point of time, some limited amount of technology transfer did happen. But for a long time it did not happen because India moved into a separate league onto itself. And there were so much sanctions upon us after our first, first nuclear program. No country was ready to give us technology. And uh, all the technologies that we today enjoy are indigenous technologies. Our scientists have taken great amount of trouble and they have developed our space programs, our rocket programs and all that. But some amount of technology transfer has happened. So that is one path which people have taken. People have taken one more path, supporting education. In India, 
it has happened through the establishment of IITs. If you see every IIT, it is actually the result of India's collaboration with some other foreign country. So for IIT Karakpur, there was one country which was supporting it. IIT Kanpur, one country was supporting it. I don't remember the sequence actually because I was not planning to uh, talk about this so I have not checked the facts correctly. But be behind every IIT, there was a country which was supporting it. So through education, they were supporting the technology, the training the next generation of technologists. But unfortunately that failed because people who study in such elite institutes and who are supposed to give back their knowledge to the country, the first thing they do is leave the country and try to give it back to the country who have supported them in their establishment. So they are going back in some sense. But the whole idea has not been implemented in the right way. The idea was that they would support education program here. Those guys will stay back and help the growth of the country. So somehow all the paths which countries have taken for technology transfers have not served the purpose. Given this scenario and sharing this idea that technology transfer should happen so that the entire mankind can benefit from the progress of technology, I propose my third argument that it is only free software which can help you to do this. In a sense, I, I am taking this argument a step further and saying that for the growth of entire mankind, for the entire mankind to reap the benefits of technology, there is only one way, it is free software. Because proprietary software comes under the controls of state, that is established governments, who can control its sale, export, etc. to their country. Whereas free software, through its founding principles, have made enough provisions in their system so that they will not come under the state control. That is the reason why free software can flow really freely among countries and can help bridge the digital divide. So I am making three powerful non-traditional arguments for free software stemming from the roots of our profession, implementing the right spirit of this profession that is code of ethics and third, having some sense of universal uh, well-being through free software. I hope that you will carry these arguments forward.